Hello everyone. My name is Caroline Lair and I'm the founder of The Good AI, a community of 200 plus AI talent and startup on a mission to help companies be more sustainable. Good afternoon as well from my side. My name is Karen and I'm leading programming and community at The Good AI. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad to welcome through three of our startup members plus a corporate guest to chat uh, about ESG data and reporting. So you may know that information about environmental, social, and governance metrics are no longer a nice to have uh, when it comes to corporate management. And more and more consumers and talent are sensitive to how comp companies operate at the social and environmental levels. And sustainable finance policies are also building the foundation for a sustainability reporting standards. However, it also brings uh, another level of complexity for investors and reporting uh, companies as ESG data collection and auditing is a very complex process that requires time and resources. So together with our, our guests today for the next hours, we'll try to identify how tech and AI can help companies and investors to navigate through the new ESG regulation, collect the right ESG data, build consistent uh, ESG strategy on the corporate side, and identified and support the most sustainable companies on the investor side. Now, before you get to meet our experts, I want to give you a brief overview of our structure today. Um, first, the experts are going to introduce themselves, and then we start the conversation. We have a few questions prepared that we're going to ask them, and at the end, we have dedicated some time to also answer your questions. You can submit your questions through the comment function on YouTube. They then will appear in our studio. And you don't have to wait until the end to submit the questions. You can already do so while the conversation is going on. And we would love to receive your question because, of course, it's called the good AI conversation and not lecture. So we want to also include you. And here are our guests. Yes. So let's welcome today our three startup founders, Patrick, Thomas uh, and Keith, and we're also happy to welcome Abdu and Karin from the Data Lab of uh, Caisse des Depots, a French financial institution and long-term investors uh, serving the public interest in France. So we're going to start with a quick introduction uh, from uh, all of you. Please uh, let us know about your background, uh, your company and your work, and we'll move shortly after that uh, to the conversation. So we're going to start with Patrick Wood Uribe. You are the CEO of Util. That's great. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, thank you, Karen, for putting this on. It's so great to be here. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us in the audience. Um, so yes, I'm Patrick. I'm the CEO at Util. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do at Util um, and then also a little bit about um, why especially uh, I'm, I'm excited about what we do at Util which may help to kind of structure some of the uh, uh, responses and questions that we look at later. Uh, what we do at Util is we measure companies, so every listed company in the world, we measure the impact of those companies on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And in order to do that at the scale that we need and with the consistency that we need, we deploy AI in the form of natural language processing on a, an evidence base of about 120 million academic and scientific journal articles. And that's the sort of structure of what we do. We can go into more detail on what that solution looks like later in the hour. Um, but I think one of the most important things is why especially it's, it's, uh, it's appealing to look at these things in this way. And I think the, the key thing as a, a kind of piece of my background several years ago, I was asked to assemble a portfolio of green stocks uh, or sustainable stocks. And I found that I, I actually ended up having to give up entirely because I couldn't do it because every company that I found they might have been uh, satisfying one requirement, namely they might have been environmentally friendly, but they were doing it in a way that was not socially friendly, or they were doing something that was socially responsible, but they were doing it in an environmentally irresponsible way. And so there were all of these consistent trade-offs that it was really, really difficult to manage. And so that's one of the reasons why I was especially excited uh, to, to start thinking about it in the way that we do at UTIL. And we map to the UN Sustainable Development Goals all at once so we can understand those trade-offs. And also, we start to think about things from the, from the company perspective so that we're really understanding the impact of those companies in, the, in a, a kind of real-world sense 
and not just measuring kind of one thing at a time, which, which takes us down a very misleading path. So that's a little bit about my background. We'll get into more details later on. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and I think Keith is next on our, our list of, of experts. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Thank Keith, you. if I can ask you to introduce yourself, you are the CEO and founder of Impactful. So can you give us a bit of an insight of what you do? Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for this introduction. Hi, everyone. So my name is Keith. I'm a French guy building a solution to help every company become more sustainable and impactful because uh, I grew frustrated of uh, having people fighting over what is good and what is bad, what is an ethical company and what is not. And I figured that does not represent the real world. I mean, we live in a world where we use coal to um, sometime power our electric cars. Uh, some people smoke, some people gamble. Uh, there are obviously more ethical company around, but we have to live with all those companies. And so uh, my definition of impact is striving to make every business more sustainable. And I wanted to do that because when I did some calculation, speaking with big oil companies, the biggest polluter in the world, Saudi Aramco, that is a listed company, um, if you help them reduce their scope three emission, their carbon emission by just 1%, one tiny extra 1% every year by engaging more, helping them find new technologies, changing mentalities. Well, it's the equivalent of planting hundreds of billions of trees. That is more efforts than all clean tech companies in the world can put uh, in a year of work. And so I realized that the solution is not only about helping creating more sustainable company, but also helping transforming existing legacy company that employs million, that pays a lot of taxes, that supports the very economy that uh, we're living in to make more sustainable decision. And the way we do it is that we, for every company in the world, we create a materiality assessment which is the list of the top 10 or 20 most impactful priorities that every company have. Each company has different priorities, impact the world differently. We help them um, structure this um, through a materiality matrix. And then we uh, provide concrete recommendations of how to improve those KPIs that can be socially uh, linked to social matters, linked to economic matters, linked to extra financial matters um so happy to join the conversation and nuance a little bit what uh, uh we'll be discussing here thanks so much keith um thomas van der hayden you are the co-founder and ceo of drink the stage is yours yes thank you thank you for the uh, invitation and for inviting me to speak today about brink and, and what you know what we are building at brink and why um so Brink was was really founded under you know one big key mobile, um, observation, which was that in the EU in particular, um, the EU is leveraging new sustainable finance regulations to mobilize uh, more capital into more sustainable business activities, and combat a lot of the greenwashing and data uh, problems that exist currently in the. Um, in the sustainability realm. So you have a lot of um, new investors that are setting up new funds to funnel money into green projects, but uh, they are having a difficult time identifying where to funnel those funds because companies themselves are struggling to actually implement some of the new sustainable finance regulations that have been emerging under the EU Green Deal. And so with a core focus on the EU taxonomy, um, Brink is building a uh, ESG reporting platform to help, on the one hand, companies implement uh, the EU taxonomy more easily and thereby more easily be able to assess to what extent um, they are meeting some of the sustainable finance KPIs that the taxonomy requires them to report on. And then on the other hand, we are working with investors to help them more easily identify where they should uh, be funneling their money uh, so that it actually starts to to be funneled into more sustainable projects, more sustainable businesses, and as a result, mobilize more capital into into the economy and accelerate the transition towards the Paris Agreement net zero targets. So nice to meet you all, and and uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and now I would like to invite Abdu to introduce himself. Abdu, you're not representing a startup, of course. You're representing a large financial institution, you and Karim. So if I could ask you to briefly introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, my name is Abdu. Uh, I work uh, as a head of data lab at KSD Depot. Uh, KSD Depot, as you said, is a, a, a major fi public financial uh, institution with a strong identity and, uh, and a rich history in, in France. Um, we, have, uh, we, we are committed in a very ambitious uh, climate uh, policy and uh, aiming for carbon neutrality, by example, or, or uh, uh, we, uh, we, we, we have a commitment uh, with uh, the companies in which we invest and uh, we, in, in, we, we develop and help asset managers to improve their ESG uh, scoring at the depot uh, by uh, using data and uh, algorithms uh, at the KSD depot in the data lab. And uh, we, uh, in, our, in my team, uh, we, the data scientists, this work every day to, to help them uh, to, 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 to improve uh, uh, the, the knowledge we have on, um, on EAG to dig deeper about uh, these uh, uh, topics. Uh, but uh, we have also uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, we have to, to comply with uh, the new uh, regu regulations like taxonomy and, uh, and we have help financial departments in, in this company uh, to, uh, to, 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 to to apply the, the regulations. And uh, so I, uh, I let Karin uh, introduce herself and uh, explain, uh, tell you some words about uh, the digital factory where we are working. Hello everyone, so my name is Karin. I'm a data scientist at Casa Depot. I've been working at the Data Lab for more than three years now, I think. So the Data Lab or Digital Factory, as uh, Abdu said, is kind of uh, an internal innovation center where we are, we are going to work with uh, all the entities of the Kesa Depot. So sometimes we can work with uh, human resources, sometimes we can work with, I don't know, the risk team or the finance team and all on different subjects. So we are, we are doing some data science that can be prediction, recommendation, natural language processing. So yes, very different subjects and topics. Approximately two years ago, uh, we created an innovation platform uh, for the asset management team and the ESG team. Um, it's composed of different tools. Some of them, um, some of them as is like governance tools, is, uh, its aim is to extract some information about the company on uh, their PDF, on their documentation. And uh, another one is um, a controversy tools. And I think we are going to discuss that maybe later. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> Karen. So let's move to the conversation now. Um, and, and we have one first question for you. Um, where does this term ESG come from? Like when, when did it start basically this ESG trends as we call it today? Maybe Thomas, you want to share about us? Yeah, I mean, I think the term ESG has really come into, into force in the last sort of like five, six years or so. So it, it, it generally speaking stands for environmental, social and governance. And it's sort of the three key factors that, you know, capital markets, for example, used to assess the sustainability and ethical impact of a business, right? So it's it's a means of sort of identifying core non-financial data metrics to evaluate whether or not a company is or is not or should or should not be considered a sustainable company and thereby worthy of, of uh, you know, investment from, from green capital funds uh, and so on. Uh, and it's, you know, it's very much a a term that's now taken on a lot of prominence and, and it's used a lot, at, especially in the financial services world to identify, um, you know, the, you know, the sustainability profiles of companies. Can you guys maybe share some, some example of um, ESG metrics? 
Sure, you... Thomas. Do you want to go first? I, I was about to chip in with something, so but but uh, but do go ahead if you have a have an immediate example you can think of. Well, I mean, I think like if in terms of metrics or things that that they that will be looked at, you know, on, under the environmental bucket, right? You have uh, things like around, you know, what is the company's greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, you know, what are they doing with respect to waste and pollution, uh, deforestation, uh, climate change, etc. Uh, the social category is more around uh, things around uh, working conditions of employees, uh, health and safety, um, diversity, et cetera. And then governance is around, you know, what, how is the company structured? You know, what kind of um, incentives are in place with respect to the board, for example, uh, and, and executive remuneration? Uh, what are the sort of, uh, you know, controls in place at a company to combat um corruption and bribery or, you know, political lobbying. So it's sort of those three buckets that, you know, in, in, all three of which are increasingly important to a lot of people when they evaluate, you know, what product should I be buying or where should I be putting my investments? Um, and more so than just pure dollars and cents, like what is the revenue that this company is generating? And, and I think these, you know, things are, are increasingly moving up the agenda in terms of, uh, of how people uh, evaluate uh, evaluate a company. I was going to say, I was just one quick thing to add. I think Thomas, you covered covered all of those those things um, really um, comprehensively. The the one thing that I think is a major shift, and is one of the reasons why ESG is so critical at the moment, is that I, I broadly think of this in terms of centuries, but it's it's probably more more. Um, uh, more detailed than that, but you sort of think of a 20th century view that people invested in companies to get their money back and then to make some money on top of that. So it's sort of returning shareholder value. Uh, and, you know, you, you buy shares in a company and then you're a shareholder and then you expect to get some, some return on that investment. I think increasingly you could have companies that will do that for you, but will mm -hmm. absolutely fail on, on other metrics that you might care about. And so increasingly, we've seen in the consumer domain, I think we've seen it in a, in a ton of different industries, people are really starting to care about the, the, the particular brand and, and care about how their values are reflected in their choices. And that happens with grocery shopping, it happens with clothes shopping, and it's sort of coming into the finance world now. And so we start to see people start to care about those non-financial metrics. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about some of the challenges that, that, that come with that. But I think that's a, a, a sort of, you can sort of think about it as a sort of tectonic plate type uh, shift in the way that people are thinking that, that feeds into exactly what Thomas is talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick and Thomas, for outlining, um, you know, setting the scene. And I think that's a good word, segue as well to you, up to and Karin, because you do represent, you know, financial institution, the investor side. Um, from your perspective, what challenges do you see are, for example, your portfolios and um, portfolio managers facing? And also as well, how have you witnessed this rise uh, of importance when it comes to ESG within maybe your own um, organization? And whoever feels most comfortably, either Abdu or Karin, who wants to start. Abdu, I think you still, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I, I was in, in mute. Uh, I, I will start and can complete. Uh, like I said, uh, ESG uh, at Caisse des Depot is very important for our governance. And uh, there is uh, many uh, people involved in uh, the ESG project uh, because um, uh, first at, at all, there is a regulatory uh, uh, obligation for us to to, uh, to 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 build uh, pro, uh, tools and uh, project uh, to be compliant in order to be compliant uh, with the regulatory uh, like taxonomy but it's not only there is not only taxonomy uh, but uh, it's uh, the, the the nearest uh, uh, regulation uh, obligation uh, but uh, two years ago at KZ depot, uh, with the asset um, management uh, business unit, uh, they uh, built a huge uh, pro uh, project to 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 improve their the scoring, the metrics of uh, of non-financial uh, 
of um, uh, non-financial uh, metrics. So, uh, by example, we try to build uh, e, uh, a scoring in for the E part, for the S part, and for the J part. And uh, so, first at all, it's uh, um, we we can improve the discussion we have with uh, companies where we invest because we invest many. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, millions in uh, many companies, and we have to uh, to to have in our portfolios the port uh, companies who respect uh, our guidelines uh, in uh, in kind of ESG because it's very important because we are a public institution and interest general interest is uh, is uh, at the but at the middle of our our action so. Um, that's why uh, we try we, we we try to use data to improve uh, our action. But the difficult is uh, we have uh, often in non-financial data there is no standard. Uh, there is uh, difficulties of uh, data quality, but uh, it doesn't mean we can do anything. Nothing. Uh, we can uh, start because, uh, in, by example, in equities, uh, uh, in market uh, capital market, we have data, we have providers, we have uh, uh, something we can build uh, to improve, uh, to do more than uh, we we used to we used to do, and that's why we build uh, our platform actually, and uh, we build the tools to to go deeper. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Thank Kelly, you is there anything? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Caroline, please go Thank ahead. You. Yeah. Hey, sorry. Thank you, Abdu. So you mentioned you mentioned one, I think, of the key challenge here, which is the changing uh, regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd like maybe to uh, dig in this with uh, Thomas, uh, because, yes, this, this, this is making it very difficult for companies and investors to follow. They are there are different kind of regulation when it comes to sustainability itself and come to sustainable finance, different framework and standards. Can you maybe enlighten us a bit here? Yeah, I think one of the big one of the big shifts you've seen, especially here in Europe in the last few years, is just the shift from having uh, you know mostly voluntary standards or sustainability regulations that were not uh, directly tied to financial reporting. Um, in the last years under the, the Green Deal with, you know, regulations like the EU taxonomy, the sustainable finance disclosure regulation, uh, the non-financial reporting directive, which will soon become the corporate sustainability reporting directive. Um, the EU is really trying to, like, tie sustainability metrics directly into financial metrics of a company, right? So looking at things like what does the company actually, you know, generate revenue from? What does the company actually uh, spend money on? So what are the capital expenditures? What are the operational expenditures? And to what extent is that tied towards sustainability, right? So um, really getting companies to dig deep into their, into their financial metrics and tying that to their sustainability metrics is, is, a, is a very new phenomenon and is very challenging for companies because uh, it previously those were kind of in separate silos, right? You had a sustainability team or sustainability manager at a, at a large company, and then you had a financial reporting team and a financial controlling team. They never spoke to each other. They probably didn't even know who they who, who the, those people were, right? They never were in the same room together. They were never on the same projects together. And now they are forced to kind of speak the same language. And I think for a lot of companies, that's very, very new um, and very, very challenging. And um, it's it you know and what that ends up meaning at the end of the day is that the 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 KPIs that need to then be reported for example to the investors are not being reported very well uh, because companies are really struggling to actually report them in the first place. Um, so that's that's really one of the big shifts we've seen is that shift from traditional sustainability to to really embedding that deeply within financial reporting. Yes, fantastic. It's, it's a uh, it's a um, it's a good one because uh, we, we we share these difficulties with the other companies uh, in France like like uh, uh, Société Générale, BNP, uh, or the other financial institution. They have the same um, difficult 
difficulties and issue in uh, in uh, because they are, it's new it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new uh, it's a new thing for for us and we have the same difficulties in uh, data collecting in uh, in uh, they don't know how to, how to build this reporting uh, in order to be compliant with taxonomy mm -hmm. by example and I think, thank you, you already mentioned the challenges, you know, and the data. And this is also a question that we received from Renata. Uh, Renata, where does the data come from? And I think um, I want to ask you, Keith, um, let's talk a bit more operational. How exactly does it work? Um, and what challenges do you face? Is there already a standard? Where does the data come from? Do we already have transparency on where the data comes from, maybe that the companies provide? How do you see the current the set of <laughs> Oh, wow. Very complex question, but <laughs> I will try to answer with my very point of view. Um, uh, what I've discovered talking to companies is that data comes in a variety of ways. You have satellite imagery, you have polls, you have figures and digits sitting in Excels, you have sensor data to collect um, a wide range of E, S, and G metrics. Regulation has done a very good job at standardizing the output. The output is called um, at the EU level, the principal adverse impact indicators. You have a number of them, uh, GHG scope three emission, percentage of member in the board. You have the number of uh, um, assets that are exposed to bio um, diversity sensitive areas. So a lot of outputs are here. And uh, I guess um, the, the, the work of all um, impact creators like Patrick is to make sense of those outputs and make them more actionable. And uh, the, the issue with data uh, is that you have to think that the input is very hard to collect. It can be really costly because to compute a, a scope three emission, it's a methodological nightmare. Nobody agrees on how it should be calculated. And then you have to aggregate bills of utilities, electricity bills, you have uh, smoke um, plugging sensors uh, on top of smoke sta smokestacks. Um, um, you, you have a lot of ways, different ways to collect that data. And that's probably why it's so difficult to have high quality rating, high quality measurement system. It's because at the input level, at the, what I call the upstream level, when we source the data directly, it's very hard to get the data. It requires a lot of consulting, methodology, accounting, uh, setting up a lot of different technologies, and not all company can afford that. And so um, it's very diverse. It's very complex to extract, but uh, there is hope because, um, I mean, technology is helping here. Uh, AI is bringing a lot of automation for everything related to text, uh, related to geolocalization um, imagery. Um, so technology is really helping here. And I think that's where uh, we're seeing a lot of progress in AI for good, is in making that data more affordable. This is really the bottleneck here. So that hopefully all the people in the downstream sector where you communicate, you disclose, you transform, you refine the raw data into actionable insights, you report them, will benefit because uh, in the end it's a value chain and everybody is dependent on those guys to get the right data, the highest quality raw data that is kind of pure, right? Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Caroline, you're on mute. Yeah, always. Additional uh, yeah, I, I was wondering, maybe Patrick, you want to add uh, some um, some element when it comes to the, the lack of also trust uh, in all this data, uh, because most of the time it, it rely on disclosure of companies, uh, sometimes even opinions. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I, I, I was about to say that's a really good follow on from, from Keith's point. So first of all, Keith, I think that that was a very insightful way of, of kind of outlining the value chain and, and precisely where some of these challenges are. Um, and, and sort of what it means, I guess, is, is, is almost, um, I, I'd say, one of the, the kind of critical factors for, for what Util does as a company. But, but the more the more that is the case of, of, of what Keith described. So 
the input data is very difficult to uh, it's very difficult to source. It's very difficult to, to put together. There's a lot of consulting, a lot of methodology, and the most important thing that, that that sort of jumped out at me about what you were saying, Keith, is that that not every company can afford to do it. And so what that means for people like me is that there are basically companies with resources do a really good job. Companies without those resources can't do a good job, and then it puts them at a disadvantage, and when they may actually be uh, no better and no worse than, than a company with more resources in terms of the impact that they have. And so when we look at it, one of the things that we're trying to do is to, to sort of level that playing field. And so a lot of it is there, there are sort of two ways that we want to kind of uh, de-bias the information that we're getting at our downstream sort of moment or sort of midstream uh, kind of moment. One of them is how do we find a way to make sure that we cover all of these companies in a consistent way so that we're not biased towards large companies with deep pockets. So that's that's sort of key, <laughs> key factor number one. Um, and then the second thing is actually one of the really difficult things is if you do have uh, something that depends on human input, uh, there's you sort of immediately run into two problems at the same time. One of them is that whether we like it or not, we do introduce judgments, uh, idiosyncratic views, uh, you know, sort of um, subjective views all the time. It's, it's part of being human. And that's one of the reasons why I think technologies like AI can really help us be better humans in the end, is that it will show us, you know, it's a good mirror on the things that we make assumptions about. So I think that's, that's a very important thing. But even if you have like a perfect uh, methodology that's, that, that you can use, as soon as you try to scale that out and get more people to do it, you start introducing inconsistencies. And so when you start to try and scale something, then you start to lose a lot of the advantages that you have in any given methodology. So to try and solve all of those things at once, I think is, a, is the really key challenge. And that's where uh, a technology like AI can really help us. But it's, it's exactly in line with the challenges that Keith outlined that we sort of develop uh, some solutions to try and help mitigate those, uh, those shortcomings. I wanted to add something here because actually mm -hmm. what you say on the downstream midstream card is interesting. You also have problem down the value chain and that is why ESG rating are so controversial. It's not just because data is scarce and so people are making estimates. It's also because people use different sets of values to talk about the same things. Um, we mentioned initially where ESG come from. ESG like was coined by people from the UN and it was like a debate over which letters should go into that acronym. And it started with EG and then people fought for the S. Should the S be in the middle? Should the S be uh, at the end? And it ended up being ESG, S being stuck in the middle, S being the link between the E and the G. And it's all about trade-off. People decided that ESNG were the thing that mattered, but it happened only in Europe. It spread across the world, but if you ask Chinese whether they favor E over S, they will have a very different definition of what S is. That ask them about diversity, uh, for yes. example. Ask them about what environmental friendly means, and it's a completely different answer for what the US think of a G or S could mean. And so different ESG methodologies reflect different assumptions of our world. Patrick has, for example, a definition that uh, what is good or bad is defined by the, produ the products and the services that you produce. Some other people will say that it's the way you behave. Some of them is how much you favor environment over social matters. And that's why that's where it gets tricky is that we work with different version of the truth and different assumptions of what are uh, the drivers behind this. And so that makes the data collection even more complex to process because nobody agrees exactly on what those data means, even if they get those data. Uh, thank you so much for outlining this. And I think the cultural aspect is a very important part because we always think data, it's numbers. It's, you know, a one is a one in every country. It has the same meaning. But I guess the point that you just raised is absolutely brilliant. Um, maybe Keith, if I can stay with you um, and tell us a bit more about your solution, because we already heard about technology, especially AI playing a huge role and potentially in the future, a bigger role in helping us sort out the ESG data and reporting, what exactly does impact fund do? You mentioned at the beginning the, um, the assessment metrics that you have. Can you give us a bit more insight on that? Yeah. So I wanted to come up with a system that would 
kind of solve this problematic way of defining what's important and what's not important, right? And I was fed up by uh, third party people, experts sitting in some kind of office deciding that E should be over S, should be over G, and with opaque methodology that would come up with a rating. So my idea was to ask people what they thought about it, okay? What you think your sh company should focus on? Uh, I realized that it was not enough to ask one person. So I asked two people, then 10, then 20, then 100. And I realized that I needed a lot of inputs from a lot of people to come up with what were their definition on what to prioritize. And that's how I, I, I stumbled upon a tool that was uh, created by the GRI, uh, an NGO, uh, that is called the Materiality Matrix, that is actually um, the result of a polling system of all your stakeholders that is asking one simple question, what are the top 20 priorities that your business should be focused on to have an impact on this world? And for oil and gas company, the answer is very different than for um, the fashion industry or for a startup. Depends on size, depends on geographical location, depends on the person you ask. And asking stakeholders, the people that are skin in the games, employees, suppliers, CEOs, investors, NGOs, experts in their industry, helps you come up with a kind of local consensus of what should be the standard in that particular company, not even industry, company. So at the company level, we're able to derive a kind of roadmap that is very actionable because it's actually a to-do list, prioritized to-do list of reduce emission through um, uh, the transportation of um, goods with electric cars, could be recycled plastic could be very, very niche things that are very specific and very adapted to certain businesses. And like most of us around here, I use AI because to estimate those priorities, I need to estimate based on um, a set of data that are already being produced by the leading standards here and the leading standards of the big companies. So big companies have invested a lot of time and a lot of money in creating those priorities for themselves. And then I leverage their industry insight to replicate that for smaller companies. So for example, if you are a competitor of Coca-Cola, for example, uh, your um, impact uh, priorities should be close to Coca-Cola. But that might differ a little bit because you're smaller, you're more tech enabled. And so I help those companies like all the stakeholders come up with that list of priority and then recommend them the concrete actions, sign that deal, work with that startup, sign that pledge, fund that foundation. And I think that's also a way to lower the barrier to entry in ESG decision making because it takes like five or 10 minutes to complete such assessment. And yeah. Um, it, it provides some answers that can help and provide different perspective. Thanks so much, Kiss. We could we could hear you for for longer, but the, we, we unfortunately we need to we need to accelerate. Um, Thomas, this is what you're doing at Brink is also very exciting. On your website, we can we can read that you're doing an AI assistant for the AU taxonomy. Can you explain us a bit how, how it works? Yeah, exactly. So we've we've been building a technology solution to help, uh, on the one hand, companies run through the the reporting requirements for the EU taxonomy from end to end, right? So companies need to identify, you know, uh, do they, for example, conduct any business activities that fall under the EU taxonomy? And just for those who might not be so familiar with the EU taxonomy, it's basically a big classification system. Uh, that the EU Commission has come out with to sort of identify uh, what can and cannot be considered a sustainable business activity, right? So as an example, uh, you might produce cement, uh, and if that cement is produced uh, with um, with an eye towards certain uh, sustainability uh, metrics, then you can say that you have, uh, you know, generated revenue or, or um, you know, made capital expenditures on a business activity that is aligned with the EU taxonomy. Uh, in principle, this is a very, um, very interesting regulation. I think a very a good attempt at, um, you know, increasing data transparency coming from companies and also combating greenwashing. But in practice, it's very, very challenging for companies to implement because they have to start to, 
you know, conduct really extensive data analyses of, you know, their financial data and map it to the taxonomy. Then they have to, for each of those line items, they have to then do a whole assessment as to whether they're meeting certain climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and other environmental objectives. And finally, they have to report on their percentage eligibility and percentage alignment with the taxonomy. But in principle, it sounds really, really interesting, but in practice, it's very, very challenging for companies to do that data mm -hmm. analysis and, and all that data assessment. And so what we're doing is on the one hand, building a framework to help companies guide them through this process, but also building data models to help with the sort of data intensive uh, analysis that needs to be done for eligibility and alignment. And, and that's sort of high level what we are building. And uh, yeah, we work both with corporates themselves who are doing the assessments, but also with um, financial market participants that are analyzing companies uh, with respect to their alignment with the taxonomy. So the, it, we're kind of uh, building technology that provides the link between the financial institutions and the companies themselves. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and I think this is a good segue to Karin and Abdu. Um, Karin, uh, you, I guess, have started building a kind of um, controversy detector, kind of a platform internally. Can you tell us a bit more exactly what it is and what is the intention behind it and at what stage is it as well? Yes. So um, the project emerged in 2019. The asset management team and the ESG analysts um, needed a tool to uh, screen web in order to identify uh, emergent controversy. And also they need like a warning system to tell if one of the company we invested in were subject to a controversy or not. So we began a project by redefining what is a controversy because no one had the same definition, obviously. So uh, we said that a controversy is a real fact that can be proven and then can uh, lead to a uh, financial risk or legal risk or image risk. It's um, the company must be the author of the act, not the victim. And the topic of the act must be E, S or G. Otherwise, it's not a controversy for the team. So we built a team. We were two data scientists and two um, like business person. One is an asset manager and the other one was an ESG analyst. Um, we quickly realized that we couldn't uh, build directly a um, predict, uh, predictor to say if uh, uh, we find a controversy or not because we we haven't we hadn't have, we haven't got any um, level data. So instead, we build a, like a tool to read news and to analyze them to give all the info to the person like the analysts or the um, asset management team. Uh, this tool is built in five or uh, five steps. The first one is in real time. We uh, we decided not to scrap all the web, so uh, we were working with a news provider. So we, in real time, we got the news. We need to identify uh, which company is concerned about the news. Then, uh, what is the topic of the news? Because we subdivide um, ESNG on, in, into categories. So maybe in, in uh, the E part, there was biodiversity, climate change. S part, it can be a strike or human rights, and G, uh, is it a change of the CEO? So we had a lot of category, maybe 11 or 12. So we needed to to know which uh, on which category was the news. And then uh, we need to know if it was like um, a new news, I don't know, it was um, breaking news, or if it was a subject we already seen in the past. So we saved all the news we had, and we have to do a comparison because between the news we just received in and the news we already have in order to know if it was a new, uh, new or not. And then uh, we did uh, a natural language processing to, to know uh, if the news was negative and what was uh, the vocabulary um, employed because we had a list of like words um, mostly used when there is a controversy. So we need to compare the vocabulary. Uh, and then we built um, indicators on all the group of news on the same subject. 
And when all the indicators were true, we said to the business uh, owner that uh, be careful, I think maybe your company is concerned by um, by a controversy, you need to look. So we didn't say it's a controversy, we should say, okay, you need to look. Uh, it's a really um, a tool to add them. Um, this tool is uh, is part of a larger platform that we built for, for them, is uh, in production. And uh, the aim is to uh, to have the feedback of all the users in order to improve our models, because now we can have level data with the feedback and we can work on the model we used in order to improve all of that. That's, I don't know, uh, I yeah. don't know if you want to add something, but feel free. <laughs> Abdul, you want to add something? No, okay. <laughs> well, are we good? So thanks a lot. Uh, it's great. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> so the, it's the perfect example of how we can use uh, uh, natural language processing for, for good. And so I'm going to uh, now talk with Patrick because, Patrick, you are also uh, using NLP, but for uh, a different approach, which is very, I think, interesting, very exciting, based on uh, uh, consensus with scientific publications and, and business activity. Can you tell us a bit more? Sure, exactly. So, so Karin, that's that it, that's so fascinating because it's it's actually in in many ways um, it it's very similar to some of the things that we have experience with, particularly dealing with large bodies of text and and um, the lack of labeled data is is something we sympathize with because <laughs> it, it happens all the time. Um, but um, so what we do at Util. Um, we decided to focus um, our activity it, when it comes to NLP on gathering evidence. So we find that a lot of companies, when they're looking at using NLP, is to extract information about companies themselves. And we were already seeing a lot of that in the market. But we were, what we weren't seeing was a good way to solve for a particular problem, which is how do you, uh, how do, you do expertise at scale? Um, and that was the really kind of challenging problem that we had. And so that's why we decided to look at academic texts. And what we do is we, we actually use those texts, as I mentioned, to, to evaluate evidence. What we're looking for um, is essentially the relationship between a, a given product on the one hand that is produced by a particular company. So we think about products and services uh, as our, our kind of starting uh, metric for, for what companies are, are doing. Uh, to Keith's point earlier, there are other companies that look at how a company behaves internally. We decided to look first at what sort of leaves the company's doors as a measure of um, given, you know, they generate revenue from those things as a starting point. Um, so we're looking at those products and then we're looking at the impact of those products in the, the kind of academic world. And what it means really um, in practical terms, our, our models are effectively uh, reading 120 million texts in order to find all of this out so there's a lot you know you couldn't ask a human human being to do this uh, which i think is is the best way to think about ai particularly is like if you can if you could ask a human to do it it's probably good to ask a human to do it if it's something that you couldn't ask a human to do it's good for a machine to do it um, but i think the key thing about it is that what we're able to do by doing that is we can get past um some of the quality issues that you face if you do employ a large human team, if you do employ uh, uh, human experts, is that you have challenges of subjectivity and you have challenges of consistency. So what we're doing, you can sort of picture it as uh, a large body of documents. Everything is peer reviewed. So everything that we are processing already has been written by someone with a PhD. It's been re reviewed by a number of other PhDs usually it's actually part of a longer published dialogue where papers refer to other papers. So you've got a built-in kind of sense of, uh, of ongoing uh, conversation. And ultimately what it means is that we're measuring the degree of consensus around the connection between a particular product and a particular uh, set of sustainability topics. And that gives us a, um, a, a really good way to um, essentially identify something that is, um, it, it achieves a level of objectivity by combining all of these different uh, kind of very high quality expert opinions. So we're not relying on one opinion, we're sort of relying on everybody's opinion at once. So it takes on more of the character of crowdsourcing uh, and gains some of the benefits of, of other 
very large scale activities like voting, for instance, but it has ultimately at, at the very base, it, it has, you know, sentences written by uh, people who are, who are very much the experts in their field. And so that's how it all, all comes together. That's brilliant, Patrick. Um, so what are we going to do? We have five minutes left. Maybe we're going to add a few minutes more if you, if you let us do, because I, I really would like to have before moving to the, the questions we have, I'd like to have from each of you one single advice you would have for companies struggling a bit with their ESG data reporting. What would it be? Maybe we can start with uh, Thomas. Yeah, I think one piece of advice I would have is to, I mean, companies is to to allocate adequate resources to this in the first place, right? Um, and 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 get the right people in the room. Um, I think the first step is to not underestimate um, how challenging this will be. This is not something that you will be able to, for example, if we talk about you know the, what's most relevant for what we do, the taxonomy. Um, a lot of companies uh, in the first wave of reporting which is the large publicly listed companies who, who have the resources right to implement this very very much they underestimated how much work this is going to be so i think the first thing to do is not underestimate the complexity um and so that that's one thing get the right people involved uh and and i think also just um start to really think about how you can use this type of um these types of regulations in your in your advantage right so I, I think that the days of looking at these things as, as a cost center, a compliance problem that you have to deal with at some point are, are gone. I think if you start to think about this from a strategic point of view, right? I mean, if you're looking at your CapEx, your OpEx, your turnover data, like it's not going to be enough for you to, to realize at the end of the year that you're only, you know, 6%, 5% aligned, which a lot of companies are. They're only aligned in the low single digits. Start to think about how you can actually you know, create a baseline and then move in a direction that is more sustainable and, and, and use that to your advantage and, and be proactive and, and be, become a sort of leader in your, in your industry. Because I think a lot of companies are still sort of waiting and seeing how things are going to develop. And I think the companies that are really the ones that are the leaders in the space are the ones that are going to get started on this uh, right away. Thank you, Thomas. Maybe Abdu, you want to add something? Yes, I, I will add a few words. Uh, I, uh, what I, I, I want to say is to, to financial big uh, companies to work with uh, the, the, the startups and, uh, and uh, um, uh, companies who can bring solutions like Brink or, or other companies because what you, 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 you do in uh, taxonomy is very important for us. Uh, that's uh, the first uh, thing. The second thing is to encourage uh, the the big company to work together in data collection and uh, and uh, the standardization because it's the key for me uh, to 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 improve and uh, to to, um, to 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 go uh, uh, to, to to go on on this uh, challenge. Fantastic. Thank you, Abdul. Um, Patrick. What would be your advice? Uh, well, so to, I, I echo all of the things that have been said so far, but I think that the one thing that springs to mind is is to be as concrete as possible. Um, I think what we see a lot are, are things like we plan to do X, we promise that we're going to do Y, but I think being totally concrete, even if it's bad, is is still the best way to do it. Because I, I, I always think of bad news as still good information. Um, so if you're performing badly, we should know about that sooner rather than later, and then that bad provides exactly the strategic backing that Thomas was talking about. So I think being concrete, even if it's not great news, is the best way to go. Fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. So transparency, mm -hmm. I guess, is, mm -hmm. is very important. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Karine, since you have been working on this really exciting uh, detector, and um, I'd love to learn more about them once you, once you launch it, um, what would be your advice when it comes to companies getting ready for ESG? Yeah, I'm not working every day on ESG, but what I can see is that I think things are moving fast this uh, like few years or few months so maybe it's just to keep an eye on what is going on with all the new i don't know all the new companies or all the new um, 
website that just emerged because oh, we can uh, we can rely on it to perform ESG. Exactly. So look at all the great startups as we have today. Mm -hmm. I think, think it's a great recommendation, Karin. And Keith, uh, last but not least, and I will link your answer to one question from uh, the audience, which is basically as an independent consultant, can I influence the quality of the data? So when they, when these consultants work with company, how can they help them influence the quality of the data? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. First, I would like to say that you should read you should learn, read articles, book, learn about ESG impact, because this is going to be driving a lot of decisions in the next 50 years. It's driving the politi what politicians are doing. It's driving um, your decision on which company you should um, be working for, which product you should buy, um, which company you would like to invest in. It's influencing your kid's decision, your parents' decision. Everybody's making decisions based on those sets of value. And since you cannot outsource this knowledge to ratings or third party methodology, because it's just not enough, you've seen that it has a lot of limitations, that um, they're not likely to reflect your values anyways. Set your own set of values. Be ready to do compromises because you cannot be good on every single aspect of the ESG spectrum and then try to consistently improve. Consistency is very important in sustainability because it what makes it relevant for years and not just minutes. And then try to improve, try to influence others and try to embark and don't be afraid that you're not perfect at every single dimension. That's what I would uh, suggest you do, but that you need to read and learn what it means. So actually this is a, a good way to learn more about it. Fantastic. About, about the consult, question is it uh, a question directed to me not exactly not exactly it was it, it's a, it's a question I guess the person who asked Renata is a consult she, she's a consultant herself and all oh, uh, right she's looking I can give two practical example uh, very quickly uh, one is that there are open data initiatives around that puts you the data available at the fingertips of every individual. So you can contribute there, working groups, contributing directly. Uh, we can name them afterwards. Uh, so as an individual, you can influence what kind of data companies are doing. And then you can also train yourself at um, a very specific type of data collection process. It, there are so many ways to collect data that specializing in one area of data collection, like sensors or, or imagery or just documents. If you have that expertise, you can really make a big difference because right now companies are lacking a lot of expertise. We're going to take a last question in link with, what, with data collection. We have Shi Long, which is asking what changed new ways we have in data collection and their CSRD. Anyone can answer this one. You're asking question. Yeah, we have all question coming right now as well. And no one for the. Yeah, I, I can. Uh, a, very simply, is uh, it just disclosure used to be voluntary, done yeah. on a voluntary basis, and right now it's getting mandatory. So I think by 2024, 50 thousand companies will need to report that kind of data we were discussing previously it was just four thousand five thousand companies so more data everybody's getting more happy but it's more costly obviously I, I would add one thing too is that there will be also mandatory audit requirements for that data so i think that's really important as well it's it's not just about putting a sustainability report together and put it on your website as a without the backing of, of, of real metrics, right? Because the, the, that data will then ultimately need to be audited. And if you have misrepresented what you put in your CSRD report, um, it will come back to haunt you. So <laughs> I think that's one important thing to, to add to that. OK, thanks, everyone. We're going to end this very interesting discussion here. Thanks so much to all the attendees for the participation, uh, for the great question. Thank you, all of you speakers, for joining us today. Share about your work. Again, as every time, I am totally mesmerized by tech uh, and the power of AI. 
I will really convince it's a strong ally and enabler for investors, corporates, CSR teams to support their efforts in terms of sustainability. And that's why educating about AI should always be made with a strong focus on sustainability use cases. And, and this is really what we're trying to achieve uh, with the good AI. So thanks again to all of you for the tremendous work and contribution you have in the area. Also a huge thank you from my side. And in case um, you weren't able to watch us live, we're going to put the recording, of course, on our YouTube channel. So you can again re-educate yourself on AI and ESG. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. So Bye-bye.